Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter. If you are a financial advisor, I know that the recent volatility in the equity markets has created challenging conversations for you. Before listening to this podcast, I challenge you to write down the names of the five clients who are at the biggest risk of ruining their retirements because of their fear. We will circle back at the end of this list at the end of the podcast. On this episode, we are going to present an investing philosophy and solution that has academic rigor and empirical research. Joining me is Dr. Daniel Crosby. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Laws of Wealth. He is a behavioral finance expert who holds a doctorate in psychology. He hosts the popular podcast, Standard Deviations. Last fall, he took a new role as chief behavioral officer at Brinker Capital in his new book, The Behavioral Investor is Required Reading for Any Serious Practitioner. Daniel, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Great to be here. All right. You're very popular on the speaking circuit and the podcast circuit. Personally, I think it has a lot to do with your ability to take complicated concepts and make them understandable for practitioners. So for this podcast, let's focus on the application of your book for financial advisors and specifically moving away from the dogmatic constructs of active versus passive and looking into portfolio construction through through your third lens. In your book, you quote Jesse Felder, who produces the Felder Report. And if you're on Twitter, financial advisors, I highly recommend you follow him. And in there, you quote him as saying, passive investing will ultimately become a victim of its own success. Daniel, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, I feel like we're dancing on the grave of Jack Vogel here. I think there's a lot to, <laughs> I think there's a, a, a lot to like about passive investing. I think there's a lot to like about active investing. And as you've said, I've tried to break down those walls, I think much to uh, the dismay of purists from both camps. Uh, but I'm, effectively, all I'm saying in there is that there's some truths about asset management and investing that we know. And one of them is that if everyone's doing the same thing, it tends to to not be a good idea over time. So there's a ton to like about passive management, um, namely low fees, low turnover, um, and just the general sort of I don't know approach to to managing money, which I think, as I talk about in the book, has a lot of power. Um, I think the danger, though, uh, is that, uh, as I talk about in the book, when something becomes uh, a measure, uh, it ceases to be good over time. When, when, something, when, the, when the benchmark becomes sort of the end unto itself, that can be dangerous. And I give, uh, I give examples uh, in the book. I talk about uh, when, when Britain colonized India, they, they were, the British were squeamish of the rats and cobras. And so they, they started providing uh, rewards for, for rat tails or cobras um, or, you know, dead cobras, thinking that they would, uh, you know, incentivize people to, to kill cobras and kill rats. And what they did was raise cobras and raise rats <laughs> to, then, uh, to then kill them, <laughs> to then kill them and bring them in. So, uh, I, you know, I think there's a lot to like about passive investing, but I think that we can do uh, slightly better. Than, than what I would call market cap weighted passive investing uh, if we take the best parts of it and try and uh, adhere to this third way. And this third way is results-based behavioral investing. Give, us, a, give right. us some of the constructs of this philosophy and process. Well, so one of the things that I, that I take from, from passive or the best types of passive is that it needs to be rules-based, right? So I think one of the reasons why 85% of passive funds outperform their active counterparts is because the best passive approaches are rules-based. And so that is one hallmark of good asset management. Call it active, call it passive, whatever. We know from the research and in the laws of wealth, I cite uh, over 200 studies on this rules-based versus discretionary approaches in everything from uh, stock picking to try and measure prison recidivism uh, and the next thing, and and found that 94.6% of the time, simple rules beat human discretion. And what's cool in, in our world, in the world of finance, is that rules not only beat discretion most of the time, they beat them at a lower cost. 
So, you know, uh, operating from a system of rules not only allows you to do well, but it allows you to do well on a budget, uh, which is a, a big part of winning winning the asset management game because we know that anything you're paying in fees, you know, comes right out the other end of your performance. And so, yeah, being rules based, I think, is one uh, one unifying theme that any good behavioral investor needs to get on board with and not leave it to human discretion. So, what are your thoughts on what makes for a valid rules based investing process? So it, it's interesting as this term uh, research-based or evidence-based investing has come into vogue. I mean, some people that are tossing around evidence-based investing would be uh, strict buy and hold market cap weighted passive investors and others that use it with, with just as much conviction would be highly active, highly concentrated, say trend following uh, investors and, and both can sort of claim that they're operating from an evidence-based paradigm. Uh, I, I set forth three rules for good evidence in, in my new book, The Behavioral Investor. Uh, the first is that I say that it needs to have data, right? It needs to have empirical support. That makes sense. But the second one I think is more ignored. And the second one is that it needs to make theoretical sense because when the Fed releases 45,000 pieces of economic data per year and we regress them against, you know, only two handfuls in many cases of extreme financial events, you know, we're going to see some correlations that might, uh, might exist where they shouldn't. We're going we're gonna to put all that in a blender and sometimes we're going to get some spurious correlations that come out. So the second piece is not only does there need to be empirical support, there needs to be philosophical or theoretical support. There needs to be a reason why it makes sense. You know, you look at something like the Super Bowl indicator has been historically like a pretty good indicator of where the market's going. But we can look at that and go, well, this is dumb. Like, there's no reason why this should work. So I'm not going to start a Super Bowl hedge fund uh, and try and invest this way. And then the third piece is that it needs to have a behavioral component to it. We see time and time again, people will mine out these market anomalies, calendar effects, and other sort of small market anomalies, and they quickly get arbitraged away because they're not behaviorally tough to implement. So the only sort of hope for an enduring edge is that it needs to be empirically based, theoretically sound, and it needs to have some root. There needs to be some psychological pain and implementing it. And you look at something like value investing, which is having a rough, uh, a rough decade, really. <laughs> but you, right. <laughs> you look at something like value investing and, and, you know, it meets all three of these criteria, right? We, we see it show up in the evidence. Uh, it makes sense why it works. And it's hard to do. Like you can run a screen, a value screen, see what comes out and, you know, want to want to throw up when you, see, when you see what comes out the uh, you know see what comes out the other end of that screen because it's ugly and that's why it works so those are sort of the three conditions i think so that's a, a great segue into another theme around this which is it's risk first investing what do you mean by that yeah so i think you know there's there's a number of of underappreciated risks that i try and uh talk about in the book you know, we've got market risk, we've got idiosyncratic risk, and everyone knows about these things. But I think being a behavioral investor uh, means at least two other types of risk. So one is behavioral risk, which I would argue, you know, is the biggest, the biggest risk of all, is the risk that all these great things you know, all the great studies you've read up on, all the knowledge in your head is going to be all for naught because you won't have the discipline or the behavioral rigor to implement these things. You know, I, I posted a chart. I posted a chart online today talking about this very thing. I talk about how education is sort of necessary but not sufficient for the average investor. Uh, and I, I analogize this to, to nutritional uh, decisions, which have a lot in common, I think, with financial decisions, because we often know the right thing to do, but it doesn't feel right. So, or we, we just don't care, like in a moment, right? So, mm -hmm. in 1990, the U.S. started mandating this very strict nutritional labeling so that, you know, anything you pick up in a grocery store right now, you know just what's in it. And since that time, since the time that uh, in 
consumers started having more or less perfect knowledge of what they're putting in their bodies, obesity has doubled, right? So, um, <laughs> behavior, <laughs> you know, behavioral risk means understanding that just because you've read the right books and you know the right things doesn't mean that you're going to make the right moves and you have to manage yourself. And, you know, I cite, uh, I cite a study in the laws of wealth that's got to be one of my favorites. It talks about the highest flying, the, the highest performing uh, mutual fund of the early 2000s. So 2000 to 2010, this focused equity fund got 18 and a half percent a year uh, on a time weighted basis. And the average investor return of an investor in this fund was negative 11 (laughs) percent. So this was, you know, this was this was the best mutual fund of the decade. And for the average person, they couldn't take the ride like they would. You know, this this fund would come into their awareness when it had run up a great deal. They'd get excited. They'd invest. It would mean revert or, or struggle for a bit. They'd jump out it would go back up again, they'd pile back in, you know, so uh, our ability to capitalize from all this great evidence-based investing, the ceiling on that is our own behavior. And I think that's an important risk to, to understand, appreciate, and manage. I'm not sure if this is in your new book. I didn't see it, but I've been following your work for a while, and I cannot remember if it was your TED Talk or a lecture I found on YouTube, but you talked about the fact that you use an investment advisor yourself to help mitigate some of that risk. And it always stood out to me that somebody that understands how markets work would actually have to hi- would choose to hire somebody else to help manage those behavioral risks. Yeah, one, uh, one idea that I have... Uh stolen, mercilessly stolen from Jim O'Shaughnessy. He has this great line in his book <clears throat> that I'm going to mess up, but it says effectively, you know, the, the first key to being a great behavioral investor is knowing that you're just as susceptible uh, to bias and, and failure as the next idiot, <laughs> you know? And so that's something, you know, I've written, I've written three books on, on behavioral finance now. Uh, and, you know, despite this, I know that all of these great things I know about the right thing to do are, uh, you know, a thin defense against actually doing the right thing. And so, yes, I pay an advisor to manage my money, even though I am, you know, uh, from a knowledge standpoint, perfectly capable of doing that myself. He just serves as a line of defense against me doing something stupid because, you know, I am, I am absolutely as least, at least as, greedy and fearful as the next person. And, and incidentally, the fact that I have to follow financial news so closely as sort of an occupational hazard of my job means that I do what I tell others not to do, which is, you know, watch financial news and, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, look, read, or read about every zig and zag of the market, which the average person uh, doesn't have to do and in fact should not do. And it makes it easier for them to make the right decisions. So I feel like I'm, uh, you know, uh, actually in a very bad spot to make good investment decisions simply by virtue of having to follow the markets. Yeah, just an excellent personal philosophy. Now, Daniel, my favorite section of your book is where you talk about the behavioral investor has no master of the universe. And specifically, and my preference for this section is based on 20 years of experience in this business and seeing every unicorn manager out there. It's the paradox of skill. Tell us about that. Mm. Yes, so it's, it's interesting. Like it's, this is sort of heretical to say, but when, when Cliff Asness and AQR and others have, have really drilled down on the masters of the universe, you know, the Druckenmillers, the Buffets, uh, these extremely wealthy people who have uh, outperformed benchmarks so handily, what they find is what they really have in spades is not esoteric knowledge or an inside track, but just discipline. You know, just the discipline to do the things that that we all know. Uh, so, I think there's a type of magical thinking that uh, that some in the asset management world ascribe to certain investors. Right? They're sort of unicorns, or they're just different, or they have this touch. Uh, but the research seems to suggest uh, that yes, they are different than you and I, 
But the difference is not that they have some sort of preternatural skill or, or insights into the, the markets that we don't have. It's just that they do the right thing time and time again uh, when the rest of us are scared or panicked or, or uh, greedy. And so, yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'm speaking to there is discipline, again, uh, is the greatest good in the, in the world of asset management. Which falls back into the rules-based theme and applying the behavioral overlay to get better outcomes. Is that fair? No, that's that's absolutely fair. And I think you have to uh, again, like when you when you read these things, right? When you when you look back at a chart and go, oh, if I had only, or when you look at a back test. You know, there's there's none of the emotional variability. There's none of the pain uh, in there. And you have to understand that these things don't unfold in real life the way they do on a chart. They're slow. They're grinding. They're painful. uh, They're uncertain. So I think you need to take every measure you can to get out of your own way. Uh, And in fact, in the laws of wealth, I I advocated uh, that asset managers should work four days a year or fewer, and uh, no one has taken me up on that yet. So. <laughs> uh, that's great. So uh, received a question, Dr. Crosby, from Corey Hofstein of Newfound Research on Twitter. And his question to you is, what do people misunderstand about behavioral finance? So it's interesting. I thought that was, Corey posed a, a number of great questions. I thought was that was the best. And I actually responded to that uh, this morning via a tweet with that chart that I mentioned. And I said, the thing that I think people misunderstand is that they think that awareness will be the savior of the, the bad investor that our, as our understanding of, of bias and prejudice and, and cognitive missteps grows that we will dispassionately you know, integrate these things into our lives and go, oh, you know, I was blind, but now I see and wasn't I silly and now I know better. Uh, And there's nothing to suggest that that's the case. Uh, (laughs) And I say this, I say this with a with a great deal of pain as someone who's devoted his life to educating people about behavioral missteps. Uh, None of it helps very much. And so I think, um, I think the thing that we have to do is designed systems and processes to to keep people out of their own way uh, with using the rules-based systems that we talked about, but also to provide for financial advisors, and this is something I'm working on with Brinker right now, to provide just-in-time financial advice. Uh, you know, if you liken it to a personal trainer, we know that uh, <laughs> we know that nutritional information isn't enough, right? So that's sort of the educational piece. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We know that having a personal coach helps, but it's not always enough. Um, That's that financial advisor. What I think the future of behavioral finance looks like is having someone there to slap the donut out of your hand, right? You know, right as you're about to eat it or right as you're about to hit that sell button. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think betterment and other financial technologies have done a really good job with this where they will make someone, let's say someone's about to sell, um, Betterment has a feature where they'll say, uh, well, hang on a minute, effectively, Uh, here's the tax consequences, you know, here's the tax consequences of what you're about to do. Here's sort of the the savings you'll be missing out on. Here's the future dividend income you'll be missing out on. Are you sure you want to do this? And so I think we have to provide uh, emotional feedback that is equal to the emotional valence that they're feeling in a moment, right? You're not going to say in a moment of passion, in a moment of fear, you're not going to go, oh, I read in Crosby's book one time that I shouldn't do this. You know, you need just in time feedback uh, that has an emotional valence that's just as strong as the, as the emotion you're feeling there. And I think that's the future um, because education simply uh, doesn't do a ton, frankly. And hence, to bring it full circle, while even you yourself hire a financial advisor and pay them for that real-time coaching. Absolutely. Absolutely. To keep me from being my own worst enemy, to, to give me someone to call to say, hey, that stuff you wrote about was right. Don't do it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. So the last question. 
Dr. Crosby, if somebody's listening to this podcast and they decide that they really want to learn more about behavioral finance, behavioral investing, besides or in addition to your books, what are the handful of resources an advisor should turn to to get started? So I have a, I have a, a whole list. So if people will Google, I get asked this question uh, all the time. So if, if you'll Google a nocturne capital reading list, I have it, I have it all uh, laid out there. But to, to answer the question, you know, right here, uh, all of Richard Thaler's books are incredible. Um, Michael Mobison's books uh, are incredible. Uh, for, the, for the very, very beginner, uh, Carl Richard's book, The Behavior Gap, uh, is very good. Uh, and uh, Nassim Taleb's book, Black Swan, is quite good as well. But I have a whole list uh, broken out by sort of interest area on that reading list. And uh, I think, it, you know, I think it'll point people in a good direction. I'd also encourage people to read up uh, books like uh, Lou Anne Lofton's Warren Buffett, Invest Like a Girl, and You Should Too, or, or uh, Meredith Jones's uh, Women of the Street I think that women are sort of the uh, the ultimate behavioral investors. There's a there's a large body of research uh, to suggest that women do uh, quite a bit better than men in these things, and it's down to their behavioral control. And then the final book I would read uh, would be Brian Portnoy's uh, Geometry of Wealth, because it has a a wealth of resources about once you've made all this money, uh, how do you make meaning of it? How do you incorporate it into to living a good life? So. Those are off the top of my head, but I've got more resources there at the, the reading list I mentioned. I'll have a link to the reading list in the show notes, and I'm also going to put a link to your most recent podcast with Brian, where you guys do a much deeper dive on, at an academic level, on your new book. So advisors, I suggest you take your list of clients from the beginning of this podcast, order a copy of Dr. Crosby's new book, The Behavioral Investor, for each one of them that is struggling in this market. Put your business card in as a bookmark on page 174 and write a short note that says something to the effect of, Mr. Client, I know that you have concerns about your portfolios. Please take a look at the bullet points on page 174. Then if you're interested, read this fascinating book and let's discuss how to apply these principles to your portfolios. Dr. Crosby, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My absolute pleasure. Thank you.